Okay. Are you ready for the first question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we'll try it. All right. When did you first start seeing my interest in cars? Well, probably a couple of years ago when your brother was getting older and he became more exposed to auto automobiles. Uh, I could see it in your mannerisms. You began to take interest in what he was learning. Because I think personally, uh, you realize coming down the road, you're going to have to repair your own vehicles. And it's best to learn from somebody that knows a little bit more than you do, which would have been your brother and your father. And that's kind of where you get your skills from. You inherit it, and you apply what you learn, and you grow from there. That's all part of being thrifty, making your own repairs, and helping other people with their problems, and you grow into a fine young man, and you have some skills to get out and face the world. Definitely. Definitely. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Um, and that big black thing sitting in your dad's driveway, that car belongs to you, and that ain't a bad-looking Ford. No, sir. <laughs> You're gonna have to get out there and drive it, probably. Well, before Christmas, I guess. It'll it'll be done hopefully by the beginning of October. Um, Dad and Cameron were supposed to have worked on it, and they haven't yet. They were gonna try and get it done before me before me getting home, but I'll be home in three weeks for fall break. So in three weeks. Yeah, fall break. Oh, good. October tenth, uh, I'll be home that night. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, hopefully it'll be running soon, though. Um, yeah, I hope so. Next, uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, can you recall the first time I helped you or helped someone else um, fix or do something car-related? Well, it seems like uh, back when um, – your dad and Gary were putting valve stem seals in that V8 engine in the old uh, shop building. I think I saw you around handing them wrenches and looking over your shoulder and learning what you could about the uh, valve job they did, putting new seals on that engine, and I believe they eventually put that engine into the Maverick. Yeah. And you were there, and I think I saw you driving the Maverick down the driveway and back. So you were about 16 years old, and I saw you actually moving forward and, and, and beginning to learn. And later on, a year or so later, you applied some of your knowledge working on your Thunderbird. So that's how you learn things sometimes. If you've got the, the skill and the inbred desire not everybody has it, but that uh, skill you learn is going to follow you the rest of your life. You'll always have it. Definitely. And you don't have you don't have to pay somebody fifty fifty dollars an hour to do what you can do. Exactly. That, that's the good feeling about it. Yeah, it is. It really is. All right. Um, the next couple of questions are about you. Um, when did you first become acquainted with cars? Probably when I was about 10 years old. And it started off with um, my dad grabbing me by the shirt collar and dragging me out from, uh, I guess, my mother's apron strings and teaching me how to change spark plugs and how to change a flat tire and how to change oil in the car. And most of those old rattle track cars, they took a lot of maintenance on them because the engineering we have today wasn't perfected so the average person had to do his own repairs change his own oil and change his own tires because generally there wasn't enough money to go around and that's how the mechanics of today evolved and uh, your dad followed that path very well when he was coming up as a youngster and uh, I taught him to do a lot of things, working on his old junky Mustangs and 
pulling engines out, put transmissions in, and you know, Kenny was kind of the same way. Yeah. He had the uh, inbred knowledge and the desire to fix his own cars, and it all started out with a little junky Volkswagen I brought home for him. Yeah. Kind of started it way with your dad when I bought him the, uh, an old junkyard Volkswagen. I paid uh, thirty dollars for it, and he drove it. He repaired it and drove it back and forth to school. Wow. Yeah. He got good fuel mileage, and he went to the mountains with it a couple times with one of his girlfriends. And I think he traded it for a Mustang. And, you know. As he went on, he began to grow and learn more things about automobiles, and it helped him a yeah. lot in his teenage years. Yeah, I, I, th I often think that me and my dad are, are in the same position in the way that we learned from our peers and our fathers mainly, but, yeah. you know, it's not necessarily something that me and my dad do for a living. We just mainly do it right. so that we no, don't have to pay others. You have to have that good basic want to and the skills. Yeah. And of course, a few tools. Yeah, of course. Um, do you remember your first uh, big fix or your first big project? Well, yes, I do. I had a uh, 49 Ford convertible that had a bad transmission in it when I bought it. Oh. I bought it out of a junkyard for 40 bucks. So I brought it home and pulled the transmission out and rebuilt the transmission. Was that the same car that your dad didn't know about? Yeah, same car. Wow, I remember that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, he didn't know about it until I uh, brought it home and said I got to fix the transmission and I bought the car. Yeah, I was about uh, 14 years old. Wow. That was the first major. <clears throat> the rest of it was bicycles and and lawnmowers. Yeah. Which was fairly easy to fix. Yeah. What would you say you know most about when it comes to being an auto mechanic? Like, is there a particular brand you prefer? Do you know the most about a certain motor? What is your forte? Well, generally, I've become a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. Really, uh, I don't have the tools and the knowledge and the skills to perform major operations like uh, my son Ken does, but he was on the growing point of his life when uh, we put him in college, in Gaston College, and he earned that two-year degree. He was well on his way, but he stepped into the newer type of repairs with computers and in diagnostic tools that my generation didn't didn't have available to us. We didn't need them. The automobile industry changed so dramatically, and I could see that coming. That's why I encouraged Kenny to go to school and get at least a two-year degree so he could actually make a living at it. And he pretty much took my advice, and uh, he's, he's done very well. Done very well. Now he's got all the knowledge that he probably will ever need to pursue that career for the next ten years, anyhow. Yes, definitely. Yeah. You. And then by that time, you'll be fifty-five, kind of looking for a different direction of teaching over to college or something along that lines, where he don't have to be pulling a lot of wrenches. And working night and day to make a living. Yeah. Would you say that Mercury is probably what you know most about? No, not really. I just grew up in that era, and I had Fords, and I had Mercury's. I just liked the Mercury better. It basically was basically the same as a Fords. Yeah. But as I grew older and family came along, married and got family coming, uh, we bought newer cars, and we could still make some repairs on them, but the whole fabric of the automobile industry started changing so rapidly, we couldn't keep up with it without buying a lot of tools, 
diagnostic tools that you have to have. So you, you can't you can't make any repairs without right. it. So even this Ford truck I have today, other than the basics, oil change and a radiator or an alternator or something simple, diagnostic, I have to reach into my son Ken's basket of tools to make any repairs and let him do the diagnostics on it. Right. Yeah. That's kind of tough. Yeah, it is. Um, That's kind of tough. So I'll keep my old Ford till I pass away and then after that, <coughs> I don't know what after that. Are we going to be flying jet planes around the sky to go get groceries? I don't know all that. I hope not. I hope not too. <laughs> I often wonder the same thing. No, there's no regulation there. There's no way you can regulate lunatics flying around in the sky. It's got to stay on the ground. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I do think we'll get onto the interstates and lock ourselves into a, into a signal coming off the edge of the road, and we don't have to drive our cars. I think that's in the making. Yeah. If you're going to drive two or three hundred miles, you can lock into onto a, a beam, which will have to be embedded into the guardrails or the, the roadway that'll pick up a signal and just right. drive the car straight yeah. line. Yeah. All kind of stuff coming down the road. Hydrogen, uh, electric, uh, many, many more. Modes of transportation, not just driven by gasoline. Yeah. Technology is coming faster and faster. Yeah, especially, well, I mean, with everything, but also automobile industries. Most oh, yeah. cars are not even going to be affordable anymore just because of how advanced they are. Well, I don't know. There's still plenty of inexpensive cars out there. You're right. You're right. Uh, depending on what you want on your car and how big of a car you want. Yeah. You know, they are making smaller cars over in Japan and China, places like that, which are kind of like the Festiva. They get 50 miles to a gallon, but it's not 20 feet long, and, and it's got all kind of bells and whistles on it. It's good basic transportation. Yeah. For the average person, that's probably what we're going to evolve into. Yeah, you're right. All right, I think that's I think that's all of the questions that I have. Well, that's great. I think.